We have been doing a series called This Is Us. It's based on the television series. Maybe you guys have seen some of it. And so we've got one more clip that I want to show you that has to deal with fathers. And we're going to show that clip without interruption this morning. I think it's going to work. And so watch this clip, and then I'll come back and talk about it. I love this clip because what it does is that it shows you about the way a father supports his child. The backstory on this, and if you guys have followed this series, you know this little boy Randall was abandoned by his father when he was a newborn child and left um, at a fire station. And um, the family adopted him and took him in. They have two other children that were born in the same hospital at the same time, took him in and made him part of the family. And now they're going through this process of raising him and supporting him and let him know that he is going to be taken care of. And I love that aspect of him being on his dad's back and his dad giving or doing push-ups. The part that um, I think in the actual episode that it does a little bit better than what this clip does is that even after his, his instructor says, that's enough, you can stop, he doesn't stop, he keeps going. He keeps going, and he keeps going, and he doesn't stop. And finally, the mom has to come over and actually, because this father, what he's saying is that I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to push hard. I'm, my strength is enough for you. And even when someone tells me that's enough, I'm going to say, no, it's not. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep supporting you. You know what? That's what a father does. When I think of doing a Father's Day message, there's kind of two kinds of messages that you give on Father's Day. One is to let everybody know how great their father is and that they should support him and love him more. And the second one is to tell fathers that they can keep going and to encourage fathers to be the very best fathers they can be. And here's my rationale in this. On the first one, um, I can't change the people who are around me. I can't change what you think about but here's the thing, for the fathers, I can change and help you do the right things and encourage you to be the best fathers that you can be. So that's what I'm going to do this morning is just encourage you to be the very best fathers you can be. There are three thoughts that come to my mind when I think about encouraging fathers from a father to a father this morning. I just want to encourage you in this way. Let me just say that if you do have uh, the, the, uh, a smartphone and you do have uh, UVerse events, I do have my notes on there. We couldn't get them on the website, but I do have them on that program. And you can go in and just search for live events for Faith Church, and you can pull up the notes that way if you'd like to follow along. From father to father, there are three things that I think every father needs to know. And one thing is this, who you follow determines your destiny. Dads and men... Who you follow determines where you're going to go. I say it all the time to, to kids and to people here. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. But it's the same thing for every man here. Who you follow determines the direction you're going to go in life. Don't believe the fallacy that I can follow other people and I can do other things and then I can come home and be a family man. I can do things that are contrary to family or contrary to, to my, my wife and my marriage and my kids. I can live two separate lives. You can't live two separate lives. Eventually, those two lives will meld into one and eventually you have to choose which way you're going to go. Unfortunately, with a lot of dads, they choose to go a different direction that their family is. Mom can raise the kids. I've got other things to do. I've got a business. I've got things that I'm needing to do. And a lot of dads, when they come into hardships, they shut down and they run away because running away is easier than dealing with the stuff that they're going through. But let me tell you, men fix things. Men fix things. When I've got an issue in my life and my family, I have to step up and be a man and fix the situation because men fix things. We had a young man that was coming to our church for a while. He and his family had come over from another church uh, that was about 40 miles away from where we were at. It was an outlying community, and they had some difficulties there and some conflict with their pastor. 
And so they started coming to our church. I'm not completely sure why they picked our church other than I just believe the Lord sent them. Early on in our conversation, their conversation became negative about their former pastor and about their former church. And I just told them right up front, listen, your, your former pastor is a friend of mine and I know who pastors are. And I, I as best I could, just said, I'm not, I, I, can't, I can't sit and let you badmouth another pastor. Here's what I knew. If they're going to badmouth him, they're going to badmouth me someday. Does that make sense? Don't you believe that when someone's badmouthing someone around you, that they're only badmouthing that person? Someday, when, that rela- when your relationship breaks down with them, they're going to badmouth you. So let's stop that right up front. I tell you, and I'm just of this opinion, don't touch the Lord's anointed. If there's a church that's going through a difficulty and you're a part of that, or I understand that kind of stuff, and we all go through that stuff, but you let God fight those battles. You keep your heart pure in the process. This young man came with his family, and through the process of a couple of years of them attending our church and being involved in our discipleship processes and coming to our services, and we poured into him over a two-year process, and over that two-year process, we saw lights come on in this, in this young man's life. Lights come on. I mean, spiritually, he lit up. Spiritually, he learned so much. Spiritually, he was here. He brought his family. They were faithful. They were consistent. And what I saw in his life is that he became a man. He became a man that said, yes, we go through difficulties in our life. We go through struggles. But there is a process that I walk through. And if I will keep my eyes upon God, and if I will follow the right people, what I'm going to find out is that I'm going to come to the right place. And my kids and my wife are going to watch me walk through this and come to the right place. And after about a two-year period, he came to me and said, Pastor, we are going back to our old church. We are going to meet with the pastor and we are going to make amends. I feel like God is sending us back there to be his right hand, to be his strength, to be the one who helps him out. And he is, and to this day, and that was probably six or seven or eight years ago, to this day, he's on the deacon board at this church. He is his pastor's best friend. He helps out in the church. His kids are involved in the church. All of them have great relationships with God. Why? Because this man, through a tough time, decided that he would go the right direction and follow the right direction, and he made a good choice. I love this scripture in Proverbs, the 17th chapter, and the 6th verse. Let me read it to you. In this version, it says, an old man's grandchildren are his crowning glory. A child's glory is his father. An old man's grandchildren are his crowning glory, and a child's glory is his father. I don't have grandkids yet. I'm not even going down that road because I get chastised whenever I say something about having grandkids. But those of you who do have grandkids, you know what it's like. You know how special that is. But let me tell you, what's even greater is that your kids have a father that they can love and look up to and believe in. And I realize that we have all different family structures here. I realize that. But whoever that man is that your kids look up to, and let me tell you, we have such a deficit of that in our community and in our world. Men have to be the ones who lead the way. And I just want to encourage you men here this morning to lead the way, to be the men of God that God needs you to be. Secondly is this. Deep in the heart of every man is a desire to do something heroic. Deep in the heart of every man is a desire to do something heroic. We want to be the knight riding in on shining armor, right? And come riding in on the horse and save the day. We want to be that. Men want to do that. Inside every man is this desire to do something that is courageous, that's outside the norm. Heroes always do the right thing. Heroes always go the right direction, Sometimes we don't go the right direction. We're not being a hero. Heroes are the ones who are always going to go the right direction and do the right thing. And what I'm encouraging you guys to do is to do the right thing, is to go the right direction, is to be the men of God that you need, that God needs you to be. Lighting issues. All right. Let me keep going. That's God saying, hurry, hurry, hurry. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Let us be the type of men that follow the right direction. Number three is this. 
The stories your family tells about you at the end of your life are being written today. The stories that your family tells about you at the end of your life, they're being written today. What you do for God really matters. What you do today really matters. God has a plan, a purpose, and a direction for each one of us, no matter where we are, no matter where we come from. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and that plan and purpose is being written today, going the direction that you're going. Philippians 7, 14. Flip over there, if you would. Flip to Philippians. Don't you love that? Flip to Philippians. I want you guys to see this portion of Scripture. It's kind of lengthy, but I want to read it to you today because I think it, it really crystallizes what I'm saying here. Philippians, the third chapter, starting with the seventh verse, it says this. This is Paul talking, and he's, he's talking about the hardships that he's gone through, and he's talking about how his life has made a difference. He says this, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ Jesus, the righteousness that comes through God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to a re resurrection from the dead. Verse number 11. Now, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, listen to this, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love Paul's attitude here. Forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. I'm gonna go the direction that I need to go. I'm gonna make right decisions with my family, with my kids. I'm gonna be the man of God that someday when they sit around and they talk about me, it's gonna be positive. We all make mistakes, I understand that. But forgetting what is behind, to the best of my ability, starting today, I'm gonna make decisions that are gonna take me in the right path. My dad is here this morning and I can't leave a Father's Day service without talking about my dad. I have never known anything else in my life than my father. The pattern of fathership and fatherhood and fatherdom that I learned was from him. I don't know anything else from that. But the more I'm around other people and the more I counsel and the more I get to hear your stories, it, the more I'm thankful for the man of God that he has chosen to be all of his life. My dad's accomplished more on accident than I'll ever accomplish on purpose. He has done great things in his life. He's touched, great, he's touched people from all places. But you know what? Here's, here's the thing that I appreciate about my dad the most and that I want people to say about him and say about me someday. I've never heard him say an off-color thing. I've never walked in on him in any compromising positions or watching things that he shouldn't watch. He has lived nothing but the highest amount of integrity and purity in his life. And even at this stage of his life, he takes his time to take care of my mom, to take care of his family. He does what he does out of compassion and love for the people who are around him. He is the embodiment of this scripture and the embodiment of Christ. He does not do things for his own pleasure, but all he does is think about how he can please other people and take care of his family and love the people around him. And I promise you, one day, when we look back on his life and the life of the Goins legacy, we can look back with pride knowing that he was the man of God that chose to lead the way in purity. I'm proud of that. And this morning, I salute him and I salute you dads. Be the man of God that's the hero. Be the man of God that blazes the trail for your family. You will never, ever regret it. Oh, oh, oh.